uh, well, in our uh, Zazenkai, our meditation retreat, like we have today, um, I think that everyone comes to a Zazenkai like this wearing way too many clothes from samsara. That's clothes of busy work, a busy mind, constant talking in your jobs and work, and too much emotion that goes along with the way. We feel dragged around finally by having too many plans, too many things in the work, too much of this or that, and not enough of a simple life. So with all the clothes of samsara that we're wearing, one on top of the other, we feel heavy and burdened, and we're in a great hurry for something, anything, whatever it is to release us. So we come to a zazenkai. We feel finally that we have to get to some nice level plane out of the rocky hills that we find that we're struggling in. Anyway, we want something, whatever it is, to give us release. We'd like something that's fresh and untouched by any kind of defilement to surround us for a change. And we'd like mundane life to be kept at bay. Well, we don't have to look any further than us because our core, our hearts are undefiled and fresh and beautiful. We only have to get in touch with ourselves as we are, not as we think we are. We want beauty, kindness, uncomplicated friendship, and we have all of that because everyone's heart is the same. Why can't we see that, and why do we have to sit on a cushion to recognize it? Our hearts, our cores, are undefiled and fresh, and we possess all possibilities to do any action. We have many problems in our mind and emotions, but they're latent until we unearth them and work with them, like in Zazen. We're capable of cruelty, and we're also capable of great compassion. What we actualize are the latent propensities that we have that we often don't even recognize for desire, hatred, and delusion. But we also actualize compassion, profound insight, and loving kindness in our daily lives, sometimes without even realizing it, because our drive for it is hidden. Before actualizing, when all things are still in a neutral state, hmm. that is, only possibilities, we are like evolving fledglings. We test the waters of many things to understand who we are. We make many mistakes and learn, or most of the time we don't. But through experiences, we come to understand who we are and how we can be so different so often. We come to respect these differences in us and then to respect these differences in others. We experience oneness with everything and also we experience how different and varied everything is. In all this, our core, our Buddha nature, observes carefully with awareness. Our Buddha nature contains all things, excludes nothing, and possesses the kind of purity which contains all and acts with understandable balance and circumspection. And when necessary, instantaneously, beyond understanding, like a thunderbolt on occasion. In the Zendo, in a quiet atmosphere, we can look dispassionately at the clutter in our mental and emotional lives. But can you do this at home in a all day Zazenkai like this when you sit with everyday reality? But this is a really good practice because the final outcome for us is that if we don't finally carry our whole practice into the midst of the most mundane part of the world, our practice will only last for a short time. After the pristine purity of a Zendo, Harsh, mundane reality will wipe out a half-hearted practice in a very unsympathetic way. 
but a wholehearted practice can deal with worldly pressure in the midst of very insular or chaotic habits. We have the choice to follow a thought that leads to a path, that leads to a direction, that leads to a life in samsara, that leads to forgetfulness of our true nature. To backtrack, we can recognize that we're bound in samsara by our own self nature. And we begin to, real, to release the thoughts that bind us there. As we release them, we also release our emotions one by one. And that takes a lot longer than thoughts because there's a lot more energy to emotion. But then we find the original thought that began the trek into samsara. And we can work to release that one too. It's harder to do because it's a perception of the world as being in a particular way and is further entrenched in our belief than light and loose thoughts moving across the mind. With patience, however, we can extricate ourselves from the binding power of a thought and return to the useful tool that it was, which is not so much to determine the nature of reality except in a superficial way. And we then come back to silence, which is the way we can come to understand the nature of reality. Sitting with clutter inside and the emotional burdens we've taken on is the beginning of unloading everything. We dispassionately look at the thoughts and emotions present and release them by disengaging from them as soon as they appear. We've made them into flesh and blood by giving them life through our belief and lots of attention and time. And now we want to let them go by refraining from further grasping. Release will also take attention and time. And we've learned that the more we invest time, attention and energy into thoughts, the more we feel compelled to follow them as ideas and then live them as realities and the longer it will take to find our way back from them. But unless we want to live permanently in the unreal landscape of samsara, we have to loosen our grip on self nature and find our way to silence. Silence doesn't only mean the negation of noise. It means living with noise without reacting to it or being influenced by it. Eventually, we learn with experience not to be fooled by the apparent reality of a thought or emotion and learn to tread lightly with them. With a focus on the body instead of the thinking mind, we refrain from activity with thoughts. If we sit quietly, even for a few moments, Buddha nature and reality move the mind toward balance. All we have to do is nothing except to remain quiet and composed. Without getting lost in thoughts and watching the flow of reality and thoughts and empty and emotions, silence in small gaps here and there can appear. And we become aware of silence as a possibility of our mind and wait patiently for further presence of it. Silence has always been present in our lives, in moments of beauty, in moments of great interest or unspeakable moments. In all of these moments, silence has accompanied the presence of wordless activity, art, music, love, nature, good food, personal moments untouched by ego, and any kind of satisfying work. We are silence without being aware of it. We are Buddha nature without being aware of it. We are undefiled spirit and body without being aware of it. So in spite of living in a world of contamination, defilement, impurity and corruption, we come to meditation to meet our pure, courageous, undefiled, unshakable spirit and body intimately for ourselves, to taste our true nature intimately for ourselves and to know our Buddha nature intimately for ourselves. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> if you have any questions. <laughs> Peter. 
come closer. Okay. Oh, wait, what's this? Yeah, she can't. No, we need to push this away. It's too far away from me. How about this? All right. Okay. Is that better? Sure. Okay. Any questions? (laughs) (laughs) Now we've worked that out. Joel, I tried to call you, but was I think you, you just you, you just got back, I think. Right. Hi. Sorry. Okay. What happened was at Santa Barbara, Mike Newhall was giving a talk, which was really amazing, actually, and very helpful. So um, what happened was it went over because they said, "Well, can you stay a bit and answer more questions?" Okay. So I stayed. That's what happened. Okay. Did you get the message? I did. You did get a message. I did. Did you start speaking in the message? I mean, did you start? Did you leave a message for me? I did. I said thanks. <laughs> you said thanks. <laughs> I said thanks. <laughs> well, that's for letting us know. That's a beautiful message. Thank you so much. <laughs> that was it. Uh, well, do you have a question? Any questions? Joel, you probably have a question. Well, I can, it's, it's, I'm in a kind of crazy place, so I can ask you the question I asked Mike, which is huh? um, basically true of me right now, which is that, I mean, he was talking about ordinary mind is the way, which is so wonderful. And I told him that at this point, right now, for quite yeah, several weeks at least, my mind is absolutely extraordinary. I mean, it's floating around all over the place. Um, and um, how to work with that. And I think it has a lot to do with insecurity. Like, it's hard for me to let go of the thoughts because something like um well i have a lot of thoughts like that i'm not good and i grab onto them because i don't have enough confidence that indeed I am good. I mean, the Suzuki Roshi thing, you're perfect and complete just as you are. I mean, I have a lot to improve, but uh, my basic thing on kind of a more mundane than level than Buddha nature, which, you know, of course, you know, it's cool and all that, but basically, you know, I'm a good person, I think, on the whole. <laughs> <laughs> And um, because I feel uh, not secure enough in that, I grab on to things that I feel are saying that I'm not a good enough person. Uh, Whether they're true or whether that is the intention or not. I mean, that's what happens. So anyway, so my mind is absolutely extraordinary, which is not a (laughs) <laughs> classy Zen state of mind. What can I tell you? So if you can help me on that, that would be great. Well, I, I think probably the same saying of Suzuki Roshi was that your core, your Buddha nature is perfect as it is, but the self has a lot of work to do, you know, with one thing or another, only because we keep, you know, running out in the mud and playing around and, <laughs> and you know, and I, I think probably it's, not a bad thing, you know, when you see a lot of thoughts telling you you're no good or something like that, you can see for yourself how unreal it is eventually, because if you just sit with them, they don't really affect your life, if unless you grab them and start, you know, going further into them. If you just look at them, they really have no power over your life at all. And it's just, they're in there and they're part of you and you don't have to act on them is the whole thing. You can just observe their reality and let it be and observe that they really have no power over your life at all if you don't think further about them and grab on and and go into them a little bit more. Well, that's very true. Um, And 
I would say I'm finding it very difficult right now not to grab. Yeah. Um, and uh, and uh, <laughs> it's a real pain. Uh, so, of course, what you're saying is, I mean, there's a level at which, um, you know, I uh, can, I mean, it's like I don't stop what I'm trying to do, like sit zazen or do music. Uh, and they're, they're okay, <laughs> but it's very obsessive. There's a lot of grabbing onto it. I mean, yeah. So, yeah, right at this point, right now. So you're just seeing the hard work of what's necessary. It's not just sitting, it's like seeing all of these things and, and ungrasping, taking your hands off of them and letting them pass. And I know the drive is really hard to uh, back up what you think is true, but uh, what your what your practice is when you're looking at them is to find the unreality of those thoughts and to see that they aren't true. They are just thoughts, nothing further. They're like a basic temptation rolling across your mind and saying, look at me, look at me. <laughs> and, and you can grab it and think about it and make yourself feel terrible, or you can see that they really can't affect you unless you take them into you in some way right uh that's very true um but you have to stop identifying with them well that's exactly it i mean but like i think the thoughts are saying i'm bad and at least i mean of course i'm the one doing that but there are statements being made a lot out there that my understanding is that it's saying you're bad. Um, and, <laughs> and I grab onto that. I mean, and that is a mess. So in terms of not grabbing onto that, there seems maybe to be a point where I have to have confidence that these statements are not true, however they're intended. I mean, they're not true as I'm interpreting them and grabbing onto them because I feel they're um, a major attack on my being. Yeah, and, and Joel, you, you can't reason your way out of them. That no. You can't think about them and destroy them with your thoughts. You no. really have to be patient and let them literally leave you. They, you can't force them out and you can't pretend they're not there and you can't pretend they don't have a hold on you. So yeah. you're, any kind of reasoning will not solve that because that's, they're kind of there from reasoning. Exactly. From watching your thoughts in action, but you don't, you identify. So the first thing is to do is to recognize that the identity is wrong to begin with. The identity of, of uh, your thoughts being real. Oh yeah. Well, my thoughts, I think to a certain extent, I understand that my thoughts are real, but they're still there. Yeah, that's what I mean. And you only have to be patient and wait. You can only let your body and your mind work on that together. You cannot think your way out of those kind of thoughts. Yeah, that's very helpful. Yeah, because all you, do is, all you do is submerge them that way. Well, it's also by thinking about them, I'm grabbing onto them. Yes. I'm feeding the obsession. Yeah. And so, yes, that's very helpful. Yeah, thanks. I mean, it's- Anybody, anybody have any ideas about this? Would anybody else like to say something to uh, Joel about this? Jeff. Jeff? Yeah, I, you know, I struggle with the same thing as well, but what I found is, thinking of thoughts is just really what they are. It's literally just a wisp of energy in the mind. It's, it's a little bit more than nothing. And <laughs> like Jane, Jane said, we identify with these things and we think that they're true and they're not, and they're most of the time they're not. So that's always been helpful for me. Oh, thank you. Thank you. That's very helpful. Yeah. It's a hard thing to do for me. But Matt? Matt's next. Yeah. Um, 
uh, I guess I'm going to put my question to you, Jane, regarding what Joel was saying. So um, are you saying basically that uh, uh, he can't desire his way out of this? In other words, you know, if, uh, if he, he wants to solve this, if he's desiring for this to go away uh, and to be more confident, he's just adding an additional layer to it. And so all he can do is sit, suffer, and watch. Do I understand that correctly? Yes. The sit, suffer, and watch is correct. It's like if you get angry, you can't reason anger away. And you can't reason uh, a thought which is making you feel bad away. It's the same thing. You're dealing with a thought and an emotion mixed up together. One is telling you you're no good. And, and at the same time, it's, it's acting like a reasonable thing, a thought. And we identify because it's in our mind. So we assume that's true. But that's just a, a fake action or energy in your mind moving across your mind and and you don't have to believe it and you don't have to experience it any more than it is just sitting in your mind but you do have to wait it out you can't you can't reason i'm what i'm saying matt is you can't reason your way out of a reasonable thought that kind of thing mm -hmm. it's it's masking itself like logic and you, it's sitting there in your mind and it looks like it's a logical thought. And you can't reason something like that away with your thinking because it's like you're engaging, it's like you're engaging your foes using the same tactics they're using and they're better at it. <laughs> so you, you can't really do that. You have to, you know, you have to find a new way in to unseat the usurper of your house. <laughs> Which is what it is. You know, remember Suzuki Roshi said that we're all the boss of our own house and that's our world. And anything that comes in to usurp that position is untrue and you have to unseat it and let it help it out the door. You can't fight it and you can't hide it on inside. You have to let it sit there until it leaves. It literally leaves. It won't stay without energy or feeding or fuel or something. So you get rid of it just by remaining composed and careful and aware. So as long as you're aware with it, it can't control you. But it doesn't belong in your house. It's your house is you and Buddha nature as you are. But it, it's usurping itself as being the one in control. It's not. It's just like something flying through. You just have to wait it out, though, because it is an emotion as well as a thought. So, yeah, but quickly, I just, oh, go ahead, Jane. No, go ahead. I just wanted to thank Matt uh, for his comment, which elicited such a beautiful thing from you. It, it was really helpful. <laughs> thank you, Matt. Mike. I'm going to come at this from a different direction. Hmm. When you talk about the inner, internal dialogues we've got in our minds and that we're trying to quiet that down during Zaza and stuff, my problem is that I don't even realize I'm thinking sometimes during Zaza. I'm just sitting there and also I'm going, where did I, how did I get into this train, this, this train of thought? And I'll quiet it down and then another one jumps up. Do we want to shut that off or do we just want to let it run its carrots, run through our house, knock over furniture and go out the back door and at least it's gone and it's gone its way and then we just kind of continue on. Is it? Yeah. That's the thing I'm finding now is that I'll be sitting there <laughs> meditating. I'm like, okay, everything's kind of quiet. And all of a sudden I realize I've been in a daydream for the last three minutes. It's like, how did I get in here? And I'll shove it out the door, sit back down and no one comes in. It's like, just leave the doors open, let it run by and just, you know, hope it go quiet. Think of, your, uh, think of you as uh, developing an awareness muscle and you have to keep working at it, right? You, you have to keep using it all the time and paying attention to 
Uh, you keep bringing yourself back and seeing, oh, I'm daydreaming again. Oh, I'm off somewhere. Where did those thoughts come from? And yes, you do have to wait for them to leave and, and suffer their knocking over your furniture and messing up your house. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the you know price of letting them in in the first place. <laughs> so. Well, I'm glad I'm not the only one because I skipped in there going, why can't I just quiet down? And I was talking to a friend of mine who was wondering about what it was like to do like a five day, uh, you know, meditation stuff like this. And I do remember when I did the five day before my uh, Jukai ceremony, pretty soon they stopped running through my house. Everybody had already gone through the house and the house was empty. And I'm sitting there going on the fourth day going, I kind of like this, you know, <laughs> just leave the doors open, let them go through. And it's like, okay, I'll just get back. <laughs> I can use the uh, <laughs> And I think in what Joel was talking about is maybe that's what they have to do is let the unruly grass come through the front door. They'll tear up the place. It's like a party or something. And they leave after a while because they get bored. And then you just kind of clean up afterwards. I was thinking of another thing that Suzuki Rishi said in a talk where, where uh, people said, well, you know, what's wrong with having good thoughts when you're sitting there? And he said, because inevitably good thoughts turn into bad thoughts. <laughs> so I was thinking you let a good thought in and you're sitting there and the good thoughts telling you, this is a great life. I love sauce and this is a wonderful place to be. And then before you're even aware of it, it's, you start hearing things like, of course, I wish I could sit better. I don't know why I can't sit. You know, everybody else seems to be able to. <laughs> everybody I know has ever had a party at their house. There's always that one guest that leaves the door open and lets all the jerks come in as well. So you just kind of like, okay, whatever. <laughs> well, that's a good way to put it, Mike. <laughs> that's exactly what happens is we leave the door open and all the jerks come in. And we were having a great time with how great and inflated this world was. You know, everything about us and everything about our world was wonderful. And then somebody left the door open. <laughs> <laughs> Eventually, they'll go away. <laughs> you know, that's just hang exactly on. right. Yes. But then you have to uh, suffer the jerks, you know, <laughs> for the few minutes of inflation, then you have the jerks. <laughs> My, uh, Rachel, is your hand up? Is that your hand? Oh, I'm sorry. That's something in front of you. <laughs> I thought that was your hand, Rachel. I'm sorry. It's called the music stand in the world. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was very graceful looking. Mark. <laughs> Um, you know, there's a wonderful feeling that you have, even though you might be exhausted and and not up to par, but th the day after a party is a wonderful feeling sometimes where you just feel like, yeah, <laughs> we did it. And there's a certain relief in that. So I think it's a great metaphor for the whole experience. And I'll leave it at that. I'm a little lost on that one, but <laughs> anyway, um, is there any more answer, any more questions, or if you'd like to add something to uh, anyone who's spoken, uh, Chris? I just wanted to say I appreciated the thing you said about you know we sort of have moments of silence, and you listed a few examples, but the one I remember was uh, when we're eating good food. And I like that because in Dokusan, I was complaining to Peter that, well, samadhi is something other people get to have. I don't ever get to have samadhi. And then you said that. I was like, oh, I've had, I've had samadhi when I'm eating good food. And just like, like everything <laughs> goes away, except for that little squeaky bit of tofu and ginger scallion tofu. Or, you know, the, 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 the soup with the gamashi or whatever, whatever it is. Anyways, point is good food. And, 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 uh, it's like, all right, cool. Yeah. So I get some samadhi sometimes. Yeah, you probably do if you, uh, <laughs> that's, yeah, I, I, my favorite samadhi is ice cream samadhi. <laughs> There's nothing that tastes as good or takes you out of yourself as fast as a really good flavor of something. Yes. So people have, uh, have silence a lot more than they realize in their lives. You know, when you wake up in the morning, your mind is usually quiet. And if, if you pay attention when you wake up in the morning, sometimes you can actually see the quiet of your mind and then see a thought start coming across, you know, and like it was empty one minute and then next minute there's a single thought and then a second thought and then a third thought. 
And you can see that if you pay attention when you first wake up, sometimes that happens. So I think people experience silence a lot more than they realize. Don't feel bad if you don't have that experience, because when I wake up, I have a hundred thoughts waiting to, waiting to talk to me. I do too sometimes, <laughs> and, but sometimes I'm, I've actually seen a single thought start across the mind. You know, it's like somebody forgot to wind up the, the mind, you know, and you wake up and you're laying there and thinking, what next? And then a single thought will walk across the thought. So, yeah. Every yeah. day during practice period at Tassahara, it was always a surprise because uh, I'd wake up and be like, all right, what song's going to be stuck in my head today? And before the wake up bell even went by my window, there was already something in there. It's like, well, I'm gonna enjoy this for the first 50 minutes of the day and possibly longer. <laughs> it was I, really I like like out of nowhere. Like where the, I, I haven't thought of that song forever. Where did that come from? I read somewhere where when you wake up in the morning, like Jane was saying, it's a clear thought until you sit there and either say, I have to do something or you start, thinking about yourself having to take care of responsibilities and there's a little peaceful moment there where you can experience that samadhi before you say oh i have to do and then at that point your identity is is, is solidified your reality is solidified you're awake and you're like okay and then i'll start the whole train of thought and i've been trying to stretch that period where i wake up you know it's like where you wake up and you can fall back into a dream because you're not sitting there going i'm michael dreaming I'm just the dream and you fall back into it. And when I wake up in the morning, I'm trying to, I, I don't know who the master was that discussed this in a book I read, but that when you first wake up, you don't sit there and say I or must or anything like that. You just kind of let everything happen. And it's kind of a peaceful moment. And then you go, oh, by the way, I've got it. And then you've lost the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, I, I find like if you do wake up and you feel very quiet when you first wake up, listening to things helps you know, the bird or whatever it is, or any sound. It's just, you maybe can extend it like a half a minute or something. Anyway, of course, the best thing, the best thing to do is sit zazen. Yeah. Get up in the morning, <laughs> sit zazen. No problem, that ain't, problem solved. <laughs> that early in the morning, I'll fall back asleep. I mean, it's not zazen anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Is this any questions? Is that it? Well, we... Now I will. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know if this is can be construed as encouraging, but hey, it's my stab. Um, uh, today, and I was sitting earlier. I couldn't get on the screen, but I, I was sitting, <laughs> and. Um, I had, it's rare, but one of those times where I sat there thinking, there's absolutely no difference between today and the first time I ever plunked myself down on the cushion. At that moment, I felt I had the same mind. And it, it's been quite a while. And the reason I say it, and it's important, is what is beneath that thought now, which wouldn't go away, by the way, beneath that thought was I think Jane or Peter, I'm not sure, maybe both of you have referred to a certain unshakable faith. Mm. I don't even have to, you know, find that thought. <laughs> it's like a, a knowing and it, it is an unshakable faith to just keep sitting. You know, and I want to reason it and I will, by the way, I could spend hours trying to cognitively like a plumber twisting that thought out of me. But what really makes the difference is, is, is that faith, which I didn't think my way through. It's just through sitting and, and being with teachers that could speak in a way um, that evoked a silence, even though it was a silence through words. And so I don't know how encouraging that is, but I'll tell you, it's encouraging to me because um, those kinds of dark thoughts, you know, when you say, oh, I'll never change, no matter how long, if um, it would be pretty discouraging if that had never altered. And instead it's just, a, it's an occasion to remind me of, of uh, what is uh, genuine beneath 
all my reasoning and words. So thank to both of you. You're welcome, Rachel. This that unshakable faith is in your real nature. That you whatever happens, you know, is you're you can handle it. That's what I think. Anyway. But thank you all for your questions. You say to yourself, well, what have I got today? You say, I don't like that. You say, oh, I, I hope it's going tomorrow. That's the end. 